you guys doing today? This is for the author's talk for Infinitum, an Afrofuturist tale uh, between uh, myself, Tim Fielder, and my brother. Announce yourself, please, sir. Oh, um, Arthur J. That's right. That is my other sibling. Yes. Uh, I figured. That hard, though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we're here today uh, for this monumentous festival, and we are going to discuss a little bit about life, a little bit about how we started, and then segueing into Infinitum, which, you know, is, I'm happy to say, I think sums up a lot of my experience, and it'll be good to correlate both of our opinions. So uh, when do you first remember meeting me, man? Hmm. You know, it's funny. I have a vision of you and Jam. Obviously, you're a twin. For the audience out there, I have an identical twin brother named Jim. Yes. Tim. He is Tim. Apparently, I named you guys, is what I heard. Mom and then. Wow. They always gave me credit for that. Yep. You never heard that one before? Yep. Apparently. Okay, so I actually asked the question, what Timmy in the world Jimmy. were you thinking about naming me Timmy? I just thought like because it rhymed, Timmy and Jimmy. It wasn't that deep. In okay. Any event, in any event, the first time I remember, you know, it's funny. I don't know if I remember this or if I just remember the pictures, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I remember you guys as babies, obviously, laying there. But the actual first, yeah, that. But yeah, yeah we exactly. used to shake a lot. Yeah, you used to shake a lot. But the main first kind of real memory I have is I think it's a picture more where you guys have these white hats on and these striped shirts and I think red pants. I remember you guys like two like Buddhas, like like you said, shaking like this. You know, yeah, it was hard to keep yeah, your uh, balance with all that weight. You know, yeah, exactly, very squiggly like um, recent additions and uh, to the clan and uh, final additions, I guess. Even though mom and daddy, you know, they always like definitely wanted a daughter. So I know mama told me they, they, they were afraid to try again <laughs> for fear they yeah. would end up with five, if not six boys, so. Right, that, that was a botched attempt that like instead of trying to get a girl to basically got two more boys. So I think the oh, warning, the warning was sufficiently yeah. like, don't do it again. And exactly. like you said, you end up with seven boys. Exactly. But uh, uh yeah, my earliest memory of you and Boston. Oh, me. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. You know, my earliest memory of you guys was specifically the 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 Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, yeah. So we would watch Saturday morning cartoons. And of course, you're six years older than me and Boston is three years older. So it's 60, 63 and 66. Uh, right. Uh, lots of six is like number of the beast. <laughs> but uh, the the idea is that we were grew up on a diet of Saturday morning cartoons, because back in the day, you really only had three ch channels, NBC, ABC and CBS. So my earliest memories of you guys was like uh, uh, Jerry Anderson's Stingray and the Thunderbirds. Yeah, that's what I remember. I like. mean, the thing, the thing about it, like Stingray and the Thunderbirds, we never really, we couldn't get that where we live. Like we couldn't get, we couldn't get that. That was actually later. Cause I remember one time being over at Bill's house, Miss Lyon's house, Bill mm -hmm. Beverly. In Tupelo. Uh, in Tupelo, Mississippi, my mom's best friend, Linda Beverly, and her son and Bill and me were like within a few months born of each other, first sons. And uh, I think they got a bad reception because this is all at the point, antenna television, no cable. <laughs> it was a bad reception from somewhere. You know, Tupelo didn't really have a television. I think it like Memphis or something. And there was like Stingray. Right. That's but what like, I remember. Like, like super fuzzy. Like you couldn't see right. it. it was just like you were hanging on the edge of your seat trying to see spaceships or underwater vehicles. Right. And uh, and then years later, not a whole lot later, but years later, 
when we started going to Chicago to hang out with Bill and them again, that's when we first got a kind of real good view of Thunderbirds because Thunderbirds came on in Chicago. Um, Thunderbirds, Speed Racer, Gigantor. Kimber, the white line. Kimber was later because Kimber, that was more like how, when we, no, when we Kimber was later for you, but for us, for Jim and I, it was like, oh my God, it's Kimber. And, you know, that was just blew our minds. Yes. I agree with that. It was a mind mind blower. I remember basically like the television thing, looking back on it, it was like a, a portal into another universe. And so everything was about the television, you know, like, so even if we went to Chicago, I remember very distinctly, like my whole schedule, I made my, my desires around our schedule was all based around the fact that Speed Racing and Kimber showed twice a day in the morning at eight something. So I wasn't going nowhere before that. I wanted to catch it in the morning. And then they think it came on around three or four o'clock. So whatever we were doing, we had to be back at the house so we could catch that episode of Speed Racer or Kimba the White Line. Um, All right, now, so you understand when you say schedule, because Jim and I were the youngest, particularly myself, we had no control over what the entertainment was. So basically what you were into was what we were into. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. that, that's, that's interesting. Right. I didn't know you were going to admit that. But yeah, that's what it was. Because, I, you know, people like, oh, how'd you get started? Right. That's, all, that's how you get started about. in comics. Right. I'm like, uh, that's because they basically stuck a comic book in my hand and told me to draw. That's what it yeah. was. Yeah. Well, anyway, I don't know about sticking it in your hands. I think more like you were into my. Like you would mess with myself. Uh, yes, you know. yes, uh, and and that would continue on into uh, 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 because uh, we used to have just at the think at the time just one theater in our town, Paramount. In Clarksdale, well, that was, was Roxy and Paramount. Okay, well, we couldn't Roxy. go to the Roxy. We were too young. Y'all used to go to the Roxy. We were too young to go to the Roxy. Yeah. I mean, we didn't get to go to the Roxy until we got to a certain age because it was all kung fu movies, but also softcore porn. So, mom and right. dad. I mean, that's why Boston could get in because he snuck in when I tell him. He wouldn't really let us go in there, like, <laughs> not officially, like, you know. Right. Exactly. But Jim and I. Paramount. The Paramount was definitely in the main theater in right. Clarksdale, Mississippi, downtown. Mm-hmm. Willy Wonka, Poseidon Adventure, seeing that stuff. Omega Man. Omega Man with Charlton Hesse. I remember all that stuff, seeing it at the age of maybe and, five. Uh, Meet the Planet of the Apes. Yes. With, with, you know, it's a madhouse. It's a madhouse. And then the brother with the, the bald head. I remember seeing all that, and it was totally traumatizing. Uh, oh, the most it, traumatic one was uh, Poseidon. Living Dead? No. Poseidon, oh, Poseidon Adventure, right. Right, but Gene had, right. I'd rather face the demons, the, the zombies, than the water. I didn't get on a boat, ocean line, to this day. That traumatized me. Right, right. And so what would happen is uh, eventually I saw Night of the Living Dead, but Night of the Living Dead I did not see in the theater. I saw that on a Sunday after church. That was the first time I saw it, too. Oh, really? Yeah, the whole family, we were all like mesmerized by the whole thing. I, and I then the never... brother dies at the end. Yep, yep, yep. Spoiler. <laughs> oh, well, okay, well, but see, that's the thing. That happens throughout film history. Uh, and I think it's fairly too safe to say that uh, uh, that totally warped my perception. But one of the things for me, just like personally at the time, I was staying up very, very late and looking at horror films and stuff, which I don't think you guys did. I think you guys maybe later, but I remember very distinctly like looking at fantastic features and stuff like on the weekend, mom and them, mom and dad and them, they didn't, they didn't, you know, monitor TV and all this kind of stuff. With Savad? Oh my God, I hadn't thought about that in 40 years. Yeah. This was like the most ceremonies. Pre Elvira. Oh, yeah, definitely pre Elvira. Oh my God, I hadn't thought about that in decades. It was creature features, fantastic features of creature features, and all this smoke going on the ground. And then the camera would slowly creep over to the coffin, and the coffin 
would open in the words of whatever film was showing would jump out. Right. Great. I saw some very, very disturbing movies on that, like uh, Island in the Mushroom People. My first time I ever had any exposure to flashback structure, way prior to Citizen Kane or anything like that. Uh, Island of the Mushroom People. It was like these people, they were on this uh, boat. They were touring, uh, you know, it was like a yacht or something. They were touring right. around and stuff. And then a storm came. And it's funny because this echoed another movie or motion, not a movie, a TV show that traumatized me a little bit, Gilligan's Island. I know it seems strange, Gilligan's Island and Island of the Mushroom People. Right. But this whole idea that if you took a boat trip, the boat was going to you're going to become a, you know, what a castaway, you know? So an Island of Mushroom People is a Japanese movie. These people were on this boat and it was a yacht and they're going in the weather comes and they crash on this Island. And it, at first it seems like the Island is uh, abandoned or empty. And then ultimately what you see is that there are these creatures, slug creatures, they were like, you know, like dragging themselves. And so the people were like trying to figure out, what, what these things were. At first, they didn't even recognize them as people. And eventually, right. they realized they were people. And as their food started to run out, they slowly but surely would eat these mushrooms on the island. The mushrooms would mutate them, right? And the whole story is told in, in flashback because in the beginning of the film, they find this guy, they pull him out of the water, and he's in the shadows, like, and he's telling the story, you know? Yeah, it all started on such and such day and the boat was going and it crashed and the storm and all this kind of stuff. And then we start seeing the creatures and then we was like, we got to save our food and we're going to build a raft and just try to get off the island. And in the end, one by one, all these people would eat these mushrooms and they would turn over to the other side. And then it comes down to the last two people and they're like, we don't have enough food, but we're going to go. We're going to push off in anyway. And they push off in right. the water. And my man is, you know, they out there for days and days and days. And eventually these people find him and they pull him in the boat. And my man is in the shadows the whole time he's telling the story. He's in the shadows telling the whole flashback. And then, then he said, and I was out there for weeks and weeks. I ate all my rations. And eventually I was so starved. I ate the mushroom. I ate it. And he goes forward like that in the camera. And he has all the mushroom on his face it was very traumatic yeah so uh i don't remember that one and william shatner was in a demon with a glass hand it was a that was robert cole. huh that was oh, robert, right. cole. robert cole you're right right the first time you saw william, william shatner, oh, was william that shatner the gremlins the gremlins the one with the twilight zone where the gremlins were on the plane right yes that's william shatner he was freaking out on the plane yeah 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 yes so that's what i'm saying so we grew up with a ton of film stuff in the middle, across the street from the cotton field, but then we had the comics. And so the comic stuff had a heavy influence on all of us. You know, we Marvel, DC. I mean, because, you know, we didn't buy our own comics. We had to read you guys, your comics, under supervision, of course. Uh, could you give me a little idea of what you, what you remember about that? About... What aspect of it? Reading comics early? Yeah, reading comics. That's what we did. First comics I can remember reading were down at Ashby store in Tupelo, Mississippi. Okay. It was a, I guess you call it a convenience store. <laughs> it was Ashby's. And uh, uh, they had a rack. That's the first comic book rack I remember, right? And I remember going in, this is like three, four years old. So even prior to you guys being born, because this mm -hmm. is like, pre-Alabama, because I still say these guys were Alabama, right? Were they born? We were born in Tupelo, but this was 67, so I think we were one year old when the Klan oh, burned down the house in, in Russellville. Okay, first place I remember really seeing comics was this store in Tupelo, Mississippi called Ashby's. Uh, you know, family, everybody knows in Tupelo. It was a grocery store right down Green Street. So come up Barn Street where Ruby's house was, you make a left. And then it was, I guess, a block, a block and a half, maybe. Uh, right past your godmother's house on the left. Uh, A.V. Hughes, right. Yep, Ms. Hughes. Okay. So now, was this prior to the onset of stuff like Junior Food Mart where they would sell comics? Oh, yeah. Where it's prior. This is the oldest. Right, there were no franchises like that. No, I'm saying this is the primordial 
<laughs> Temple of Comics. Right. They had a rack, a rusty rack, and it had comic books. And I remember being down there with Bill, right? Seeing on the stands, Fantastic Four. Or number, Spider-Man. No number. Deep. Oh, I don't know what numbers. This is prior to knowing anything about no numbers. I didn't know anything about comic books had numbers and sequences or anything like this. This is like the comic book as a portal into another universe. (laughs) Before I could even read, I remember looking at these comics. I learned how to read. Well, Miss Herbie would dispute this, but I more or less really learned how to read by reading comics. Right. But I can remember, and I just saw this recently, like looking at comics in Ashby's, looking at the comics, and it was the issue of Fantastic Four where Ben Grimm, the thing, ended up on this planet where they had like gladiators. Like they would get these warriors from all over the universe and they would enslave them. And they were like, oh, Ben Grimm would be good. Some like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy has some version of it. I don't know, Thor. Thor had some version of it, but it's like that. It was a gladiator piece. Right. And they had this dude, he was all metal, and he had these metal strips on his face. And Ben Grimm was walking from behind him and saying, I won't fight. What is this place? And then this guy, he was just standing there like this in the foreground with a classic Jack Kirby frame. Right. He was in the foreground, and Ben Grimm was coming around him in the back. And he says, You don't know what it means to be. A slave. Mm-hmm. Yes. I remember. Okay. All like right. Three or four years ago. <laughs> I, you know, for me, my, it was a spider. Like spider. Right. 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 I get that. So for me, our earliest stuff was because we would go into the bottom drawer. And that's where we got our comics from. I mean, we would get them from the store. You know, I didn't really start formally collecting comics till. To, you know, Star Wars. That's when I decided to. That's get very late. Yeah, I know. That's for you it was late. Now. For me, Star Wars is late. That's late. For you it was late, but for me it was what it was because we used to get. We didn't have any money, right? So we had to go through you at Boston stuff. So that's why things like heavy metal, first time being exposed to puberty, was basically the delicate process of while you were off at college we would go through the drawer and you had a system set up to where you had to memorize perfectly what order the magazines were in, right? And then put them out. So if anything was folded a specific way, we knew, okay, well, at least we felt. I used to put stuff in between the issues so I could see if y'all was messing with my. But we knew that. We knew that. So what we would do is we would memorize them. Now, I know we probably were off a bit, but we used to meticulously go through. So all the stuff like Mobius, uh, which uh, actually, ironically, I have my copy of Arzak that I bought, uh, the original printing. Uh, and we, Mobius, all of the heavy metal stuff, which along with, I think for me, where it comments it, like I, I hear what you're saying about the Marvel and the, the seeing the Fantastic Four, but for me, when it really like, oh my God, this form is heavy metal, trash man spain rodriguez when boston would order the trash man from bud plant on a ups truck would they deliver it It was totally inappropriate because they had full frontal nudity everything and then we had uh that's why i was really exposed to r crom george metgers moon dog a lot of the canadian like like the thing is is like you guys hey look it's cool but you guys were still in the superheroes and all of that. Like by time, okay, another primordial. Heavy metal changed that. Hold, hold up, no, another primordial moment. This is pre-heavy metal, <laughs> pre-heavy metal. No, these are primordial moments. Okay, right. so Ashby's would be one. Haggard's would be another one. Mister Quick, to a lesser degree, didn't they have a for a little bit? They had a little comment. Oh, no, Mr. Quick in Clarksdale. Right. I remember buying E-Man, Carlton Comics. E-Man. Joe State. Joe State. But in the Black neighborhood comic books. Okay, so, but the primordial event of all times was going to New York in maybe 72 or something like that. 
Right. And we had gotten a subscription to the Buyer's Guide, which was a, a comics uh, Buyer's Guide, right? Comics Buyer. It was a newspaper, and it had all these things about comics and used comics, all this kind of stuff. And there was a store in New York City. This was before direct marketing. You could go to comic book stores and all like that. In mm -hmm. New York City, they had this one store in like Manhattan. It was downtown Manhattan. It was like in a skyscraper, but in the bottom, and you went down it's like this we begged i think it was maybe on gene now they took us to the store it was the first time in my life i ever walked into a space that had comic books from the front to the back wall to wall not like a rack with you know 20 30 comics on it but just like stacks stacks and stacks of comics and all these things that you'd only been reading about or seeing pictures of, right. they, they had there. a very high percentage of those things. So I remember getting like, you know, Star Star Reach with Cody Starbuck. I was a big well, Howard Chicken, right? I remember getting all these underground comics and stuff. All the R. Crumb, all the Rich Corbin was my man, and I had yeah, sort of new. Corbin, Rich I, I, that was, was my so last far. comic job. Because right. he had, you know, I before I saw his underground stuff, I saw his stuff in Warren. Right. Uh, Comic International, they came out with this thing called Comic International, and it collected all the Rich Corbin things he had done for Warren. And Warren was like an early kind of, I guess, what they would call above ground now. It was somewhere in between underground and the mainstream comics. Right. Horror stuff. The creepy and eerie. It had a big, big, profound impact on me too, because sure. that that was also the first place that I saw foreign comic book artists, like Alex Nino. Well, yeah, Alex Nino, that's the Filipinos, but the Philippines, but like even prior to that, Este, Esteban, Roto, Moroto, all the Spanish yep. artists and yep. stuff like yep. that, who had yep. a very, very different style, you know, from what you would see in comic. Like, those guys. Oh man, the Hunter, Paul Neary, right. the Hunter. Yep. Yep. That was a that was a major one because again it was uh, in between the superhero comics and the kind of underground. There it is. That is the Hunter classic. Boom. Yep. Um, yeah. His father was a mutant who had raped the mom, and he was on a mission to kill him. Why? Right. After several issues, he finally found him. That was some heavy. Was like, it in a nuclear silo? Yes, they were housed. Yes, up I remember that. Yes, when he got to his dad, his dad was already dying. The, it was he had cancer, or something he was already dying, but mm -hmm. he killed them anyway, right? Just for the vibes, right? Uh, you know, but it was like those things were really, really, really intense. And so, the thing to me is like when we went to, I wish I can remember the name of that comic book store, it was really, really intense. It's like one of those moments in your life where something you've longed for is fulfilled. It's almost right. like, you know, in the Quran, they talk about, you know, when you go to heaven, you're going to go to this place where all the women are, you know, all the beautiful women or something like this. That's, that's okay. what paradise okay. was supposed to be. This it was literally that. like paradise on earth. I had never really experienced such an intense fulfillment of desires right. as when we went in that, uh, comic book store. I mean, you know, later we went to uh, Chicago Comic Art Convention. A few years okay. later, your dad drove us up there. That was similar, but it wasn't quite the same intense, like everything was there, like in, you know, in one, one place. I don't know if I've ever had an experience, again, that was, you know, that fulfilled as much as, uh, you know, desire, desire had to see these things. So. Right. I, I would say that my more idealistic uh, convention uh, experiences were around that time, because when I, you know, eventually went to these things in the uh, 80s, it was not the same. It was much more of a business aspect. You start to get more into the personalities of the artists who sometimes were, you know, that some of the, I won't go into the names, but some of the artists I had dealings with definitely colored my experience of how not to treat fans and stuff because some of them were that was the 70s when you had the you know the, the fleet of cartoonists that came through at that time um do you uh because we're talking about other people's comics you know heavy metal magazine and all that but we did comics 
You did comments, but I, some I've always Ryan wondered. Stevenson. Ryan Stevenson. Ryan Stevenson. Yep. Ryan Stevenson, yep. which of course was a product of our brother Boston. Right. Uh, it was something that I remember distinctly being on the outside of, looking in at, because it was like a little fiefdom over there. Y'all were making those comics. I, I disagree with that. Yes, I disagree yes. with that. I disagree with that. You had your own fiefdom because you did it yourself, but your stuff was heavy, heavy into the concept side. We heavy, heavy into the costumes. I remember Grand Prix, uh, that character. I remember one, right? And of course, our twin brother Jim would go on to create two. Anything like that. I yeah. Yeah, yeah no. well, that's the thing. Not that's where I began to understand even at that young age, that not everybody had to actually draw everything. There are some people that's just special. It's like you have people who are character designers, but they're not animators. So what you did, which is really, I guess, to an extent, uh, an extension of what you do now is your concept design, right? Me, my style, what I did was I was a concept designer because it's heavy, you know, Ron Cobb, who I love his work, Ron Cobb, people like that, Ralph McQuarrie, Ridley Scott, obviously heavy, heavy influence on both of us. But I think what I got into was the concept design, but then the actual storytelling, sequential storytelling. And that was influenced by Boston, obviously. Uh, but it's it's an interesting um uh dichotomy because each of us went our own paths out of the four boys and I was the person who stuck with comics uh which gets me to my next thing before we go on to talk a little bit about infinite so you went off to Howard University and you st- uh, my perception you can correct me if I'm wrong here my perception was that you went to Howard University Hyla Garima was running things there and he was training you guys and what I assumed, what I thought the term was black aesthetics, but black aesthetics and how you applied them to cinema. Is that correct? Uh, Maybe that's simplistic. Yeah, I but no, I mean, I wouldn't say the trajectory was like that. It was more like I got to DC. I went there, of course, well, of course, I went there to study architecture and- uh, Which you designed a ton of houses in your sketchbooks. You did that all the time. But go ahead. Uh, went to study architecture there and uh, became aware of, first of all, this whole, I think the first time I was confronted with the ideas of uh, Black aesthetics was kind of at Howard, like where I was really, I remember standing in the library and just randomly pulling a book off the shelf and it turned out to be Amira Baraka's uh, book of essays. I think he was Leroy Jones then. It was called Home. And I remember just literally flipping through it and coming across just reading casually and coming across this term African retention. That's one of those like brain, you know, exploding moments. I was like, African retention? You know, like, what's, what's that? What's that mean? You know, uh, well, how can that be? And that set me on the course, you know, of reading of things. I used to read a lot of things early on that Baraka wrote. There was this book by A.B. Spellman called uh, Four Lives in the Bebop Music. And it had profiles in particular of Cecil Taylor and Ornette Coleman. Right. And uh, those were the first two Black artists that I was aware of who not only like were producers of art, but they had a lot of theories about what they were doing. They, there was a lot of, there was a very... Uh, developed intellectual sense of what they were doing and how what they were doing fit into the larger cultural equation and all this kind of stuff. So I was kind of there already before I even went down to the film department at Howard. So by the time I got to Howard, also I would point out, I had a professor at Howard who really made a profound impact on me. His name was Chase. I can't remember his first name. He, first of all, he was a brother from Germany. I don't know if he was wow. from Germany, but he had lived in Germany almost all, you know, most of his adult life. He spent, right. he spent half the time between Berlin and Germany. And he had a long black beard and he always had a little black hat on the back of his head. And he right. always had a cigarette in his hand and chalk in the other hand. So I remember- well, he smoked in class? He would smoke 
and draw right <laughs> on the boards. Right, right. Chalk, you know, and sometimes he would put, we would always laugh because he'd forget which hand and put the chalk <laughs> up in his mouth if he had a cigarette. Right. You know, and he would be talking about like these gardens, these public gardens they had in Berlin where everybody could get a little plot and stuff like that. But I, he was the first person I ever remember saying something like, if you really want to see the real genius, the potential of Black architecture, go to the storefront churches in the ghettos. And that was like, what? How was that? That's not like, you know, right. a Corbusier or anything like that. Right, right, right. It was like just a storefront. But his whole thing was like, look at how people transform the thing almost without even changing the material dimensions of the thing that right. really really kind of put something in my brain so by the time i drifted down to the film department like the following year i already had a somewhat concrete handle on the idea that has sort of followed me regardless of what i've done whether it's been my interest in architecture or film or art right. or whatever it kind of really doesn't matter this whole idea that there was something very specifically unique about the way that Black people conducted themselves in general, but right. also conducted themselves expressively or culturally, I would say. So now that would have a profound effect on me because, you know, we didn't have a lot of that in Clarksdale, obviously. And so when you would well, come yes back, and no, but yes and well, no. No, no, nothing that I noticed. How about that? Nothing that I noticed. Did you notice? But I did not know. Is like ground zero in terms of this very kind of. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I'm just trying to say you got out more than me and Jim did. Right. You know, y'all definitely got out more than Jim and I did. It's just that for me, I remember distinctly you coming home from Howard. And I had created, I've said this before in interviews, I created this character called the master. Right. <laughs> And he was based on Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he was wearing this military uniform. He had two swords. And I thought, yeah, it's going to be like this old kind of elderly kind of swordsman. And I call him the master. And you ripped into me about, yo, what are you doing? And I was like, what? Because I was thinking Jedi soldier, you know, warrior, right? Master, like a sword master. And you were like, you're doing this. This is a white man with swords, what are you aware of what you're saying? And that had such a profound effect on me that in the past, you know, you know, you know, you're, if you're rebellious as a kid, that sometimes you can say, oh, this person is telling me that I'm going to turn my back against it. But I just remember that having such an effect on me when I was 12, 13 years old that I went, oh my God. And I it's almost like I got stuck in gear and I never left that. It always everything just became black from there on. I was you're all of a sudden it wasn't just regular Star Wars, not it was Star Wars with black folks in it. Right. But I, I was learning, in fact the whole, the whole process of leaving Clarksdale, which I say is in the Deltas, you know, as I've said this before, it's ground zero in terms of like, you know, black culture, American culture, all this kind of stuff. Right. It was like literally like the furnace and then going to, to DC and it, and that really did allow me a certain kind of distance about it. But sure. I, you know, I was in my black power moment when I came back. Right. You know, I mean, truth be told the black Panther in the, in the context of Marvel comics in the year that it was, was profoundly radical. I mean, that was just like, there's no question so far beyond like, you know, to have a black character, who was the match of anybody around him. You know what I mean? Well, you understand 1966 was an interesting year because uh, uh, Sam Delaney started writing Nova in the early summer of 1966. Oh, didn't, I didn't realize before, that. Before, before, a month or two before, Marvel started Black Panther. Okay. But then that came out, Black Panther, I think I, it came out in like July of 66. But then what would happen in September? Star Trek. 
Oh, yeah, I thought you would say MLK was killed. I was like, what, 16? No, that oh, was a few years later. But I'm yeah, like, in 66, and of course, Jim and I, the, the, the most miraculous thing in the world happened in 66 as well, you know, in September. You know, we were born. So all these really incredible things that are very similar <laughs> to, to oh, my experience. Oh, you know, I came into existence in 1966. Yeah, so, so, so all I have to say is that I remember you having that, that that exchange with me, and it had such a kind of, oh, you know, it was like I've heard you talk about your experience seeing the light tunnel sequence in 2001. That conversation is what kind of made me go, oh, my God, what is going on? So everything. So I remember you, the one time you and Boston collaborated on a character, which is a character called Atomic Admiral which his character was pink and white. Yes. You designed the costume and Boston drew the comic, but he was white. So when I did my character, right, my version of it, I made Atomic Eric. I was in high school at this point. We were still in Mississippi. I made him black, right? And he was actually an admiral, right? In this kind of, Africa, he was in Zimbabwe, right? So that's what I was doing. It was like such a, you know, and I wasn't doing it in, in, in a overtly sophisticated manner. It's just that I knew, oh, I have the ability to take black characters and put them in these speculative circumstances where they had agents. And so that's what, it, that's what I, I guess, I, I don't know if you ever knew that, how that affected me. It affected me. Now, I mean, I remember like arguing with you about it. And then like, I remember arguing with you about, even when I was like, okay, draw a black character. And you basically do a character that was a white man, but with black dude, And I was just like. I, for, in fact, I haven't thought about that until you just mentioned it. So what was happening to me at that time, it was like literally being reprogrammed. It's like your brain is being reformatted in real time. There's someone's telling you, which I didn't think about it. Yeah, you know, I knew there were black characters. You know, one of my first superhero characters was Thunderstar, basically Jim Kelly, right? But there was no, I wasn't conscious about how I was doing it, what I was doing. So those times when you would come home from Howard to us, Jim and I used to be like, oh my God, art's coming home. So you would talk to us for hours. So that transformed the way that I viewed my work. So it went from not just seeing heavy metal, right, magazine, all of a sudden, why aren't there any Black people in heavy metal, with the exception of Ed Davis? Mm -hmm. So that is what was happening to me while, I was, while that was happening. Now, the irony is, and I guess we'll get to infinitum now, I would say this one thing, and I've said this before uh, 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 in, in other interviews. It's like, uh, I went back to school to NYU in like 2008, just before Obama went into office. And I was taking a class with one of my mutual friends uh, who was a teacher, uh, Danny Dawson. See Danny Dawson, mm -hmm. love the man, right? And I used to always complain to him, man, why can't, Black filmmakers do these massive military war epics like Kurosawa. That was my whole thing. Why can't we do that? Why can't they? Why do they refuse to do it? Now, of course, I understood technically it's very expensive to do something like that. How could they possibly do that? But ultimately, it was one day in class when I said it again, and Danny looked at me. He said, Tim, stop saying that. He said, they can't do that. You have to do it. And I was like, oh, my God. It was like another splash of water in the face at that moment. And uh, as a result of that, I had already kind of concocted the idea of Infinitum a few years before. Uh, I was telling Boston that story as we were walking down uh, to Magic Johnson's Theater. i never forget that. But all of a sudden, Infinitum became this huge thing. Uh, and I wanted to do something with Infinitum if I could. I don't know if I succeeded at it. 
you know, Ed Davis, a lot of people don't know who Ed Davis is. He's this black cartoonist. He did this book uh, called A World Pie. I think this is the issue, the one that it's in there. And I obviously, I was too young. I didn't know him. Uh, the only person who I'm aware that Ed Davis knew professionally was that generation, Howard Chaikin, Walt Simonson, uh, uh, Larry Hammer. But this guy was doing something with a black female Amazon. So all of a sudden, I was very, very conscious of that. But when I was doing Infinite, here we are, I had spent 15 years out of the comic book industry. And all of a sudden, I had come back. I'd done Maddie's Rocket, which was important, which was done for our grandparents, specifically our grandmothers. But when I do Infinitum, I said to myself, if I never do another book, if I never do another one, this is the one where it's going to be everything I've ever dreamed of doing. I'm going to put it in this one book. And uh, at least I feel like I hit it, but what are your thoughts on Infinitum? Um, gay man. Well, I can't. You know, <laughs> he says everything that you dream of doing. I have to like take get your word on that. I mean, right. the thing is, is like, I if I was just gonna do one book, if I never did another book, I wanted to put everything in that one book. Well, that's a lot of shit. In. I can say that. <laughs> I mean, it's a big. You know, the story is like. You know, I mean, it couldn't be bigger. I mean, the scale of it couldn't be bigger. I mean, the scale is so big that at times when I was reading it, I was trying to, I mean, it's a kind of, it's interesting. It's like the Superman problem a little bit. Right. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. problem with Superman is it's so powerful. So, you know, when we were kids, well, when I was a kid, Superman wasn't even really a serious character. Like the people were drawing Superman, like in the 60s and stuff. Yeah. Kurt well, like, Swan, the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, it was like a joke character, a little bit. I mean, Batman was always more interesting, like in the books, mm -hmm. um, not on television and stuff. But um, but the fundamental flaw of Superman was, you know, he was uh, invulnerable and he was immortal and all this kind of stuff. And it really wasn't until like, you know, like Alan Moore or something like that started to- Miracle Man. Yeah, Miracle Man. But even all these things are like, deconstructing a lot of the myth of the superhero and stuff. But one of the things about, I find interesting about Infinitum, and it has to do with the scale, the historical scale of it. And it also has to do with a kind of, what I would term sort of moral ambiguity about the character because he's, he's not an really, I mean, he's, he's a hero, like in some ways, many ways, I guess, but you know, he's as much a villain as a hero in at times, you know what I mean? He does he's a warlord. Job. Huh? He's a warlord. A warlord. Yeah. Well, yeah, at a certain stage of his life, he's a warlord. But at other stages of his life, he's an industrialist. He's a philosopher. He's a, you know, a soldier. He's a, I don't know if he's ever truly a civil rights activist, but there's a moment at which she intervenes and around some civil rights stuff. Um, you know, so that that to me, that's that's like one of the most interesting aspects of the book is like, like I say, his moral ambiguity, because I think what the whole the whole question of hero for black people is very, very, very complicated. I mean, even if you just do something that you can do in a lot of different arenas, if you say you take any white hero and you make them black then the terms completely change. I mean, yeah. like, if Batman was Black, like, well, you know, who would he be? Like, where does injustice lie? Does he if cover he, his face or not? Yeah, but even if he does cover his face, I mean, I kind of get the part of him covering his face because arguably a Black character would have more reason to want to have a secret identity than a white character would, right? right? Because the whole sense would be like, if a Black character did any number of the things that white superheroes always do, then the sense of retaliation would be so much more extreme towards their family and loved ones and stuff like that. So, so, so I will say this. So there are aspects of that in Infinitum, right? Mm -hmm. The aspects of that in Infinitum. And I have always wanted to do ultimately a superhero story based in the 1960s 
of what would happen to a character like that. What would happen to his family? And maybe I'll get around to it, but it's like what you're saying is you're describing the paradox of the visual Afrofuturist or, or the Afrofuturist, really, a narrative Af Afrofuturist. Well, is that no. Well, look, one of the things is I've always, I mean, I've at my age, I guess I could say at my age, but I've accepted the term Afrofuturist, but I never actually really liked the term. Oh, I was kind of uh, there, literally there at the inception of the term. I was there. Yeah. The term, well, the term. Oh, were you in the room when Mark created the term? Well, I don't know about in the room, but <laughs> it was like when he did it, like in the book where he actually first sure. articulated the term. Sure. He interviews two people. Greg. Yeah, he interviewed Greg. He interviewed Chip. And he interviewed Trisha Rose and Greg. And he was a poll who was, I know, you know, there was some personal stuff there, but uh, he also interviewed, uh, he was supposed to have interviewed Octavia. All right. Yeah, he told me that. So that's the thing. It's like, I remember that because this was in the 90s. I was very much active in, you know, doing, you know, Negroes and spaceships. I did become a professional doing it and paying the deadly, deadly price that comes with doing that type of work and being young and, you know, making mistakes like most young artists do. But I felt like it's, it's you know, and I'll say this because we're in the middle of this conversation. It's like there are people who said they, they have an issue with the term. And I'm like, yeah, but we all speak in English. We didn't really create English. <laughs> you know what I mean? We didn't really create English. And it's something to quibble over, but it's like, well, what hill are you going to die on? You know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about for myself. What hill am I going to die on? And after a while, I'm like, I need to create the book. I need to, what is, what is, because before that, we just called it Black Sci-Fi. That's what I call it. You know, and I wanted to do infinitum to show what does that look like, at least from my point of view. This is not to say that, you know, obviously there are prominent visual Afrofuturists out there working fine art, comics, film. But I wanted I knew, OK, I can't make a film. I don't know lenses. I don't know. I don't have that engine, at least right at, at that point. I didn't. Uh, we're definitely coming to it now. But I wanted to do something that was like, if there was a movie made, that's why it's painted. Like a, a lot of people, you know, some of my friends who make fun, you don't have to go in. You don't have to put that detail in there. It smells like ego to me. That's what I was told. And I was like, it is ego because we deserve to have epic stories, not just the written narrative, but the visual narrative. So if you could talk a little bit about what you think of infinitum visually? Uh, I mean, I like it, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the things that I find interesting about it are like the way it negotiates like realism and stylization. Like, I mean, I was always, I think when I was younger, I liked certain artists like Neil Adams, who for me was like, he was the apotheosis of a certain kind of realism, even though it's stylized, but but relative to the other comic book artists around him, it's, it's his thing, his style seemed real. Like it was more like, right. like his visual style seemed more like, uh, you know, like if you imagine a thing being in the movie, like it was literally, right. it had a sort of literalness about it. And I And then at that time, I would say that I probably wasn't as interested in artists, comic book artists who were more like, kind of you would say stylized, you know what I mean? Or like, like R. Crumb would be somebody I wouldn't, I wasn't going to be that interested in his drawing style at all. Right. And, but, you know, over time, like, even like, I would say, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, my favorite comic book artist, probably Rich Corbin, Howard Chaykin, at the end of the day. Right. Very, very different. Very, very different. One other thing about Corbin's style that I came to appreciate was like, it's not very realistic at all. I mean, 
You know, it both is and it and it isn't. Of course, it's used to the airbrush gave the surface texture a kind of level of realism that was really more akin to like models. They were more like less like illustrations. He used models in his illustration. He built yeah, like but I'm saying they were more like almost what we would call CGI now, like for a comic the way he used the airbrush to define the muscles and things like that was some, you know, I had never seen anything like that, but his proportions and stuff have more to do with like a Robert Crumb kind of idea of proportion. I mean, obviously more emphasizing like the kind of Frazetta, you know, musculature and stuff like that. But, but by the same token, you know, decidedly cartoons like comics, you know, Versus somebody like Neil Adams, where yeah, there was a certain kind of distortion in it, you know, wide angle lenses, kind of very just, Alex it, Raymond influence. Yeah, exactly. But like you say, like you say, Alex Raymond. These are people who drew somewhat realistically, right? Like how would Chaykin to me was interesting because when I first became aware of him, it was kind of like he was a sort of, you know, one of those Neil Adams knockoffs, a follower a little bit, who was drawing kind of right. his version of the style of Neil Adams. I know he worked. Fuse few, with like, Lee and Dan. Yeah, but like once, like when Atlas Comics started and stuff like that, and you start right. to see the Scorpion and Dominic Fortune and stuff like that. Really, he was operating under the influence of Alex Toth who really had a very, it was more like coming out of the tradition of illustration, like illustration like you would see in the golden age of pulp fiction and stuff like that, illustration. And I, you know, and like, so those two polarities were the polarities for me. So when I see Infinitum, I definitely see the Corbin thing that I like. I mean, you know, the fact that you paint it, you know, it doesn't have that, for the four color thing that we associate with comic books where the color is almost like transparent. It's like a cell, it's transparent and it's superimposed. Like the figures in Infinitum are all like, uh, you know, they're painted, they're painted. They're rendered, they have, right. They have density in three dimensionality and stuff. They do have very much, you know, maybe like you said, I might be responsible for some of this, a kind of, um, quality of drawing and draftsmanship that I associate with quote unquote black artists. And when I say black artists, I don't mean like Romare Beard or Jacob Lawrence, anything like that. I mean the kind of quote unquote untutored artists. There was a kind of style that I used, I was very aware of. It took me a while to dial in on, oh, this is a black style. Like things like Captain Soul, or like even the cover of like Body Count, you know what I mean? Like that kind of, like you would almost could kind of see it on band art kind of. Ernie Barnes, that Ernie whole Barnes, Marvin Gaye. Exact, yep. Exactly. That's how, that's like who it, I kind of It's kind of in the, what was termed by Thelma and him, the black romantic tradition. Like the posters, the black like posters that you would see in the seventies and stuff of like kind of days, Earth, Wind and Fire. The Afro kind of, uh, versions of Conan the Barbarian kind of thing. But it was like a kind of style, like in the beginning when I first saw it, I used to think these were people who were self-taught, meaning they hadn't learned proper drafting skills and stuff because it didn't have, you know, the proportions were like, let's say, impressionistic or something like that. <laughs> but what I, I started to realize over time I saw it so consistently across people with various levels of training that I was like, no, this is, a, this is a, there's something, there's some coherent ethos that's being kind of exhibited in this work. I mean, you know, there's something like, I mean, for lack of a better term, just say it, a black aesthetic happening, you know? And that aesthetic really, like if you think of the history of Western painting and Renaissance perspective and proportions and foreshortening and all this other kind of stuff versus if you go to other places in the world, but in particular, I'm thinking two places, like if you go to like, say Japan, like, you know, the high style, modality style of Japanese painting from a Western perspective, it looks more like cartoons. Right. Mobius is heavily, heavily influenced that stuff. 
Yeah, it, it, it like it doesn't look like Renaissance paintings and stuff. You know what I mean? It looks more like cartoons and that kind of stylization that you see in, uh, you know, you like the Japanese woodcuts and things like that. You, when you go to like Africa, like in the sculptures and stuff, the kind of stylization of the features and the proportions and stuff. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't associate it so much with drawing in Africa, unless you go to like Egypt, the reliefs and stuff, you start to see those kinds of stylized proportions and things like that. But I started to realize at some point that the captain souls, the, you know, body count, those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head that people would be able to access. Even Ed Davis, it's the same thing. Like in those things, you see this quality that I would attribute more to that than to like, say, you know, art school training around proper proportions and stuff. There's this really amazing moment in this book uh, by this writer, purportedly, I don't know if he is a Native American writer, philosopher, thinker, uh, Jamaka Highwater, in one of his books, and he talks about this account he had read about when he was doing research of these sort of uh, like Europeans when they were first in North America. I think maybe this guy was traveling with the conquistadors and he might have been a missionary and he had some skills, some drawing skills. And so one of the things that he would do as they were moving through the country, he would just draw, you know, as they didn't have photos then. So he would draw what he was seeing just on the level of like documenting what they were seeing, right? He would draw and so he gives us account of how he was drawing these Native Americans riding these horses and stuff. You know, he was doing sketches of himself. And one of the locals or natives kind of stood behind him and watched him draw. And at a certain point, you know, without actually being able to speak to him, communicated, hey, that's, you know, that's pretty good. You know what you're doing there. But I could, you know, I could do better. And then my man proceeds, he says, you know, in his notes, he's like laughingly, I gave the Native my tools, my pencils and the canvas or something. And my man started drawing and he said, like he was like duly impressed. He was like, wow, the cat actually did have some skills, you know, and he was <laughs> sort of surprised. And this is all his telling of it now. And Jamaica Highwater's sort of deconstruction of it. And so he said, you know, my man said he was looking at it and said, this is pretty good. He said, but the, the way the guy had drawn the riders on the horses, he would have the rider sitting on the horse, but he would have both legs on one side of the horse. And the guy was saying, this just shows that the primitive artist didn't understand foreshortening. Like he didn't understand that if you're looking at a thing from a certain vantage in space and time, like from a certain perspective, if the guy's riding a horse, you can't see both legs. You can only see one leg because the other leg is gonna be blocked by the horse's body. Right. right. And so he was like saying, he started erasing the leg and trying to, you know, correct it. And the guy was like, what are you doing? You're making it crazy. He would draw the leg back and then try to erase it again. And he was just saying, it was not, I tried to communicate to the primitive, you know, this whole thing, but he just couldn't comprehend it. And Jamaica Highwater makes this point that I always, I never forgot. He just says, no, he says, it was very arrogant to assume that the person couldn't understand that the body, he said, but what really was being communicated was for the native artist, it was more important the fact that a person had two legs than that you could see it, you know, from a certain perspective. Plus, the Western artist was clearly operating in the space of a kind of Western notion of time and space, a kind of Cartesian idea of reality where you see a thing from one vantage in one instant in time. And one of the things that you see in a lot of non-Western arts, whether it be Japan, in terms of how it flattens space, or certainly in African art, is this whole idea that Robert Farris Thompson touches on in African Art in Motion, where he talks about so many of these artifacts, these renderings of uh, human beings and human life, presume something very different from the West, which is the actuality of the thing, or the whole idea that you're not seeing a thing from a fixed point in space and time. You're seeing that thing from multiple points in space and time. And that slight distinction, what he terms African art in motion of a shifting, and I would say not a series of fixed perspectives, but a shifting dynamic perspective accounts for so much 
of this stuff that we start to get into when we start talking about kind of uneven proportions and things like that. It all is somewhat grounded in this whole idea that the image is less about some sort of scientific document and more about a kind of expressive rendering of the human form. Right. And I that's, would say that's something that's clearly, you know, at the center of uh, infinitum, if I want to say something about it. Uh, right, right. Uh, the world I come from, everything you just described, we just call it a caricature. Okay. That's all it is. It's a, it's a caricature. It, it's always an exaggeration. The power of cartooning, whether you're dealing with single strips, multi-strips, multi-page, it's, it's always about that tension between the real and the caricature the, and the exaggerated. So, uh, uh, but I've also, and I'll, I'll just end on this. It's like Richard Corbin was hugely important to me. I, I you know, didn't know the man, you know, I talked with him twice. You know, it was very fulfilling to, to know that when I showed him the work from Black Metropolis, you know, to have him say, yeah, you would have fit right in in heavy metal. You know what I mean? That was a huge deal. Uh, but I also admired him because that very 3D thing you're talking about, Richard actually learned how to do 3D modeling. He used the same software I use, which I did not know till I began to read a little bit more years ago, like, oh my God, his sets, his environments are done not only with clay and maquette, sometimes he's doing that, but he also built 3D objects. And that was a very, very powerful thing. So uh, I, I would just say this with Infinite. The caricature, the very things that you're pointing out are hugely important to me, but it was also the attempt didn't succeed, obviously, because I'm, I'm good as an artist. I'm not perfect. Far from it. But I wanted to try to merge the caricature with the cinematic. Or I should say the character, the Black character, a caricature with the Black cinematic. If I achieved or came close to it, that was the objective. All yeah. right. Same. Clearly did that. Thank you. And accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I want to thank you, brother, for uh, talking with me today about how we came up about Infinitum for the Carnegie Hall Afrofuturism Festival. Uh, and I hope the audience enjoyed the talk. And uh, uh, yeah, Infinitum now is not the only thing I want to do. Other stuff I got planned too. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much, man. Peace. Yeah.